very warm welcome to our evening service. It's good to see you. And we trust that as we worship God together, each one of us may be encouraged and strengthened in our faith. There's tea and coffee after the service, so please don't rush away, but stay if you can. Now on Tuesday, we have the funeral on Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock of our good friend Mel Reese, And uh, I'm sure that as many of us as possible will want to support Pat and the family in their loss. So the funeral is on uh, Tuesday at two o'clock at Llanelli Crematorium. And then there would be an opportunity to come back to the church here afterwards for refreshments. And if you are able to help with providing tea and coffee and just generally helping out, we would very much like to hear. We do need help on Tuesday afternoon after, this, after the service. And if you can help, please have a word with Matthew Howard. Matthew, of course, is our new church administrator. Next Sunday morning, we have family service at 10.30, and then in the evening at 6, we'll, the service will include communion. Do remember, naturally, Pat, Daniel, and Joanne in your prayers this week, and also our brother Malcolm, who's out preaching in Ferryside this evening. Well, now we're going to begin our worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he who you sent into our world to be our saviour is the one that we desire above everything to acknowledge here together. We ask that we may be encouraged and strengthened by the work of your Holy Spirit as he glorifies Christ amongst us. We ask now that you will encourage our hearts in all the hope that you present to us in the Lord Jesus. And we ask this in his great name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together our first song this evening, which is Sing to God, New Songs of Worship. you for the privilege of being able to acknowledge you together in song. We thank you that you are the living God, the one who has made us and formed us in your own image and likeness. And yet more than this, we thank you that you are the one God who has shown kindness, love and mercy to us in the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us. And Father, when we look at our own hearts, we consider our own lives and certainly the world in which we live and are part of, we freely acknowledge to you this evening that we most definitely need your deliverance. 
and your rescue. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus not to condemn us, but to rescue us and to save us. And we thank you that we see in his life one who is full of mercy and compassion. Thank you for your word that tells us the bruised reed he will not break and the smoking flax he will not quench. We thank you that he is gentle and kind and generous and merciful and rich in compassion. Father, we are sorry for those times when we doubt the reality of your mercy. But we thank you this evening that we realise again that we are coming not to a cruel, hard taskmaster or to a strict disciplinarian, but we are coming to a Father in heaven who loves us more than we will ever know. We thank you, Father, that the great demonstration of the love that we know that you have for us, for you tell us that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Father, in this life, there have been people who have done great things for us and have sacrificed much for us, but no one has done as much for us as Jesus Christ has done. We thank you that by that death that he died, he took to himself all of our shame, our sin, and our guilt. And we thank and praise and worship you this evening for the knowledge that by that death we have been set free. Father, as we were reminded this morning from your word that you call us now to live and to do good in our world. Father, we realize that we are not saved because of what we do, but you have saved us now to do those good works that you have prepared in advance for us to do. And so we pray for each other, and particularly through the remainder of this week, that we may put our energies into doing good, to be salt and light in the needs of this community, to reach out into the darkness with hope. Father, lead us to people this week who we can care for and who we can talk to about your wonderful love in Jesus Christ. Forgive us for those times when we are selfish, that we love our own opinions more than anything else, and we desire our own desires above anything else. Father, there is nothing more ugly than a selfish Christian. Deliver us from this. We ask that we may be people with a servant nature and a servant heart who delight to serve you by doing good. Father, keep us as well from sin. We realise, Lord, that uh, though we are forgiven, we nevertheless still struggle and battle and need to say no to temptation. Keep us, we pray, by your Spirit, and may your grace uphold us and strengthen us and give to us all that we need to live godly lives in this generation of ours. We do pray for our nation this evening. We realise, Lord, that there is great, it seems, uncertainty and confusion and even fear about the future. And we ask, Father, that in the midst of the confusion that people find themselves in, that they may realise that there is something solid that is available in Jesus Christ that not only encourages and strengthens but transforms and brings life. Oh, we need your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of the blind to see and to understand that the answer is in Christ. And so we ask that even in these days, you will touch our nation afresh with your great and mighty Holy Spirit, that the eyes of many boys and girls and men and women might be opened to realize the reality and the hope and the answer that is in Jesus Christ. And so we ask these things now in your blessing on this service. We remember again those who can't be here through various needs and we think of those with particular needs. We pray again this evening for our sister Pat and for Daniel and for Joanna as they mourn the loss of Mel. We ask that you will support them in their sorrow and that they might find much comfort not only in Christian friends calling and visiting but also Father in you and in those wonderful promises thank you that your word is true i will never leave you nor forsake you 
says the Lord. We thank you that that promise has its ultimate expression in eternity, where there is no separation. Thank you that your word tells us so wonderfully what can separate us from the love of God. And we thank you that there is nothing in all creation that can ever separate us from your love. And so it is because of this that we return our hearts and our voices to you in praise and thankfulness and adoration. And we do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next hymn this evening is Man of Sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. We'll stand and worship Christ together. 
reading is found in the Old Testament book of the prophet Habakkuk. If you're struggling to find Habakkuk, the page number is on the screen behind me. So perhaps a book we're not that particularly familiar with, and yet it contains within it tremendous hope for God's people living in difficult days and in difficult times. So we're going to read chapter 2 of Habakkuk. Let's hear the word of God. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death, is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will not they wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim, because you have plundered many nations. The people who are left will plunder you, for you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, to set his nest on high, to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, and the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. And your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol since a man has carved it? Or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Amen. Let's pray once more. Father, we ask now as we look at this passage, which perhaps to many of us is unfamiliar, that you will help us to understand its meaning. And by your Holy Spirit, you will apply its message to our lives that we, as a result, may love you all the more and seek to serve you in our generation and in our day. And we ask this now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I don't know if, how familiar you are with the book of Habakkuk. Um, a lot of people perhaps have read it once or twice, or maybe if you've been doing the reading the Bible together scheme with us in the church, you, you read it. And, uh, but maybe there are, it's a book that overall you're not particularly familiar with. 
But it's a fascinating book and a very relevant one. It's because it's about the issue of the challenge of living in difficult times. In particular, times when it appears that God is silent or absent. There are several books in the Bible that address this. Uh, recently, we were looking in the RBT scheme that we do together about the book of Esther. And uh, Esther is a fascinating book. As you know, the, the name of God is not mentioned anywhere in the book. And yet he is active and present all the time, steering and guiding the events in history of what we know as providence, perfectly according to his own will. I was reading a commentary on Esther, interestingly, that said, if there is any book of the Old Testament that perhaps immediately applies to us and has a relevant to us, it's the book of Esther. Because of the apparent silence, even in our days, it seems, of God working in those spectacular ways. Well, this is Habakkuk's complaint. This is his concern. If you've got it open before you, look at chapter 1. If you haven't, just listen to these words. This is how he begins his oracle or his prophecy. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. What is Habakkuk doing there? He's saying, Lord, how long have I got to go on praying to you? And it seems that you just simply are not listening. And bringing really serious things to your attention, like violence and bloodshed. And quite frankly, you do nothing. To all intents and purposes, what is going on in Habakkuk's day? is dreadful and yet when the issues are brought to God it appears as if God is indifferent he appears silent and he appears to be absent now before we look at what exactly was going on in Habakkuk's day it's important for us just to pause because we're handling this Old Testament prophecy that was written hundreds of years ago to a context that is very very different from ours we must be careful from drawing exact straight lines from the book of Habakkuk in his day to our situation today. Why must we be careful of doing that? Well, there are differences. This prophecy was a prophecy that was directed at Israel. We are not Israel. Certainly we are not Old Testament Israel, which was a theocracy. It was a nation that was ruled and controlled by God in a unique way, a way that you can't say the same is true of Wales or of the UK today. But at the same time, there are similarities. Habakkuk is bringing his complaint, his appeal to God, on the backdrop of great and wonderful heritage of God's work. There was, for example, the covenant, the special promise that God had made with Israel through Abraham. They were people who had this particular relationship. I will be your God, you will be my people. So they've got that. Then they've got the law of God, which was given to them uniquely through Moses on Mount Sinai, condensed into what we know as the Ten Commandments. This again was an indicator of God's unique blessing on Israel in the Old Testament. So they had this heritage. Then they had the heritage of the prophets, of which Habakkuk is one of them. Men, individuals who were raised up by the Spirit of God, given the message of God, and given the mandate to take the word of God to God's people in the power of the Spirit in a very particular time. Now, when we look at that, we have to say, well, we're a long way from that. But there are perhaps in principle similarities enough to make it sure that certainly we can't read the book of Habakkuk without some reference to our own context and our own situation today. For we in Wales have a heritage of Christianity. We are not finding ourselves in a land of total paganism in which the word of Christ and the news of the gospel has never had an effect, as was the case 
with the New Testament journeys of Paul going to places like Corinth and Greece. He went into situations that were solidly pagan and completely oblivious to the news of the gospel. So we're somewhat in between, in the middle of this. So when perhaps we find ourselves identifying with Habakkuk's prayer there in chapter 1, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, because perhaps when we look at some of the things that are happening in our country and we pray about them, and it seems perhaps as Habakkuk was experiencing, God appears not to be listening. Well, we do this in a context of a nation which has, at least in its past, heard the gospel. Well, this question, where is God? Or what do you do in life? when it seems as if God isn't listening, or if certainly he is absent. This is one of the things that is leveled maybe at you today as a Christian in school or in work or with family who are not Christians. They say, well, you believe all these things, but really they're just myths and fairy stories because where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence of God working? Maybe you as a Christian have had suspicions in your mind. Well, why is it that it seems today we can be as faithful to the message of the gospel today as we've always been, and yet as we proclaim it and talk to people about Christ, well, the impact of the Christian gospel appears to be absolutely minimal compared to how things have been in the past. And maybe, as you've read Christian biography or Christian history that's spoken maybe of times of great awakening and great spiritual blessing, maybe in Wales in the past, you find yourself with a sneaking suspicion. Well, where is God today? What is he doing? Is he with us in the same way that he was with our ancestors, if you like, or previous generations? Is he, does he really care? Has he somehow moved on and gone somewhere else? Why is God apparently silent and apparently absent? I want to remind you that we need to be honest about this question. You see, you don't just have to look at the country, do you? But there's your own personal experience. Maybe you go through a time of difficulty time of personal difficulty, difficulty in the family or in your life, and you, you pray. And like Habakkuk, you bring your complaint before the Lord with great honesty and great urgency. Lord, and you ask for help, as Habakkuk was doing, but it seems as if God isn't listening. It seems as if he isn't there. There are times like this, aren't there, in the Christian life? And we need to be honest about this because, as it was the case with Habakkuk, it can shake our resolve and our confidence and our faith. But as well as honesty about this question, where is God, in tough days, we also need a properly, biblically rooted response. And this is what we get in Habakkuk 2 in a most wonderful way. Well, very quickly, let me remind you of the background to this book. Um, Habakkuk is living in terrible days when he says in verse 2 of chapter 1, I cry out to you violence, but you do not save. He also lists some other things. He says, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong, God? Why is it that you see all these things happening and you don't step in and do something? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds seems as if your law, O oh Lord, is paralysed and there is no justice. Well, you say something must have been going on to make Habakkuk respond like that, something pretty dreadful. And it was indeed dreadful because again in chapter 1, in verses 6 to 11, we are given this terrible picture of how into Israel had come an, invade, an invasion force. And it was an invasion force of people who at that time on the face of the planet were the superpower, the Babylonians. You've probably heard of Babylon, the Babylonians. 
The archaeology is still there. People are still digging up bits of Babylon and the kings of the Babylonians. And they ruled with an iron rod in Habakkuk's day. And they had come and invaded Israel. And Habakkuk presents to Israel the word of the Lord. Because in verse 5, this is God's response to Habakkuk's complaint. He speaks about doing something of which you would be utterly amazed. But the thing that he speaks of is devastating. Verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreadful people, a law to themselves. And then he goes on and on. He describes their, their, their army in verse 8. Horses swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk, cavalry galloping headlong, horsemen coming from afar, flying like vultures swooping to devour. They are all bent on violence. So the picture is one of comprehensive destruction coming on Israel. So it is little wonder that Habakkuk has been praying about the problems of violence, injustice, strife and conflict. And all of this, he has told us in verse 6 at the beginning, is God's judgment on Israel. Look at the nations and watch. I am raising up the Babylonians. Who's behind this? God is. This is one of the mysteries of God's providence. And maybe you find yourself asking, well, what in the world is God doing here? Why would he allow the Babylonians, this most feared and dreaded people, as Habakkuk calls them, why would he allow them to invade Israel and come with such intense violence? And the answer, of course, is that this is judgment by God on his people because of their neglect of him and their turning away from him. And this is a reminder to us at least, isn't it, that we can't play fast and loose with God. He knows us. He knows everything about you. He knows your heart. It's no good rolling up on a Sunday with all the appearance of spirituality and piety if the rest of the week you live simply according to your own ways. You can fool me. You can fool others. You may even fool yourself. But you will never fool God. And he is jealous for the affections and the worship of his people. Just as he was jealous for the affection and the worship of Israel in Habakkuk's day, he is jealous for your affection and your worship. And he will pursue you if you turn away from him. That's what's happening here. This is why the Babylonians are being allowed to attack. But the greatest challenge to Habakkuk is that God seems indifferent. God appears to be silent. Again, chapter 1, verse 13. Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? So the effect on Habakkuk is devastating. And in verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, how long? And in verse 3, he simply says, why? Which is all very understandable, isn't it? Because they're exactly the kind of questions you ask. When you go through a time of trial and testing under the Lord's hand, and you find yourself saying, well, how long, Lord, is it going to be like this? Or why have you allowed this? These are questions of great honesty, and the kind of honesty that we must engage in when we have dealings with God. Well, I mentioned at the beginning that we can't just draw a straight line from Habakkuk's day to our day. This is a nation, a theocratic nation, a covenant nation. We are very different. But at the same time, there is a real need here for us to identify with this desire, this concern, this complaint that Habakkuk has. In our day of living as Christians, we face not the invasion of the Babylonians, but we face, we might say, the growth of secularism. That is, a worldview that utterly and completely rejects, and more than that, mocks faith in the living God. A universe, a view of a universe in a world that is cold, that has no 
place for anything other than that which can be examined, seen, tested, reasoned and observed. It makes no accommodation to the most essential human realities. And as a result of the growing secularism in our nation today, there is often great mocking of Christians. And then, of course, at the same time in all of this, because I know you've prayed about this and you do pray about it, there is God's apparent silence. Some of you might say here we've been praying for God to come and to empower the church afresh so that she may truly be a positive light to guide this nation again. And you say we've been praying for years and years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years for these things. But it seems as if God, as it was in Habakkuk's experience, is silent. And as a result, maybe you've asked those questions. How long? Why, Lord? Why is the church so powerless today? It's not that we're not preaching the gospel. We are. It's no good looking in the history books and saying, ah, they were better men. For God has always used the weak things of the world to confound the strong and the foolish things to confound the wise. The issue is not the preaching of the gospel. The issue is not the men and the people who preach the gospel. But the issue is the apparent absence of God's power on the, on the presentation of the gospel. So being honest about the situation, what is the biblical response and why is Habakkuk 2 so helpful? Well, here I think we are presented with two clear observations about God. Habakkuk has made his case. God appears to be indifferent. He appears to have walked off and been absent. He appears to be silent. But chapter 2 shows us that God is not silent. It's interesting, isn't it, how chapter 2 begins. For all of his complaints... For all of his frustration with God, he speaks and begins in verse 1 with great faith. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. He knows disaster is coming, hence the reference to stationing himself on the ramparts. But he goes there in the conviction and the belief that as dreadful as the situation appears to be, the God of heaven is one who is not silent and he is not absent. And Habakkuk's faith in God to speak, even when it appears he is silent, is faith that is placed absolutely in the right place. For look at the opening words of verse 2, bearing in mind now everything that Habakkuk has said about God being silent, we get these tremendous words, then the Lord replied. He is not silent. The Lord's reply contrasts with chapter 1 verse 13. Uh, and the second part, why are you silent? But here is the reality. The Lord replies. Now there are times in the Christian life when perhaps out of despair, spiritual depression or despondency, we may find ourselves saying, well, Lord, you, you just might as well not be there. I've been praying, I've been asking, I've been bringing my needs before you, but there's no answer when I read the scriptures. They seem cold to me. When I listen to preaching, it seems to go over my head. There seems to be no sense that you're speaking. And of course, there are times in life when life seems like this. We need to remember here in the book of Habakkuk, it is God in his perfect providence and ordering things that is permitting Israel and Habakkuk to go through this nightmare experience. And God in his providence may allow you to pass through such an experience. But in the midst of it all, we are invited to demonstrate something of the faith that Habakkuk is demonstrating here. 
that though it appears as if God is silent, though it appears as if he is absent, the reality is he is not silent and he is not absent. And friends, often when we get hold of ourselves in those situations and we say, well, it may look like this, but I refuse to believe that this is the case because we have the promises of Scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Draw near unto God and he will draw near to you. Whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. These wonderful promises the minute we begin to apply those promises to ourselves, as Habakkuk is doing here, it's precisely the moment God begins to work. So the Lord replies. And look what happens when God speaks. The very last verse that we read was, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The God who speaks when he speaks, causes the earth or the world, which causes his people such trouble, ultimately to be silent. There's an interesting pattern here in this book, isn't there? Habakkuk begins by complaining that God is silent because there's so much activity and opposition and trouble in the world. But in the final analysis, says Habakkuk here, the reality is God is in his temple, and when he speaks, the world that causes his people such suffering must be silent. You see, when God speaks, his words are always greater than the troubles in this life. That's why the Christian finds such comfort in Scripture. The devastation which is about to be unleashed on Israel is truly terrifying. It is overwhelming. They sweep past the wind and go on, guilty men whose own strength is their God. The enemy that's coming is one who derides kings, scoffs at rulers, laughs at fortified cities. No opposition appears to be opposition in reality. They just destroy everyone who's there. It's terrifying. But Habakkuk finds comfort in the voice of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord, the word of God, as given in the promises of God, is always greater than the sum of all our troubles. And when God speaks, it is clear and plain. <coughs> Verse 2, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets, that's stone, so that a herald may run with it. There is a clarity. This is simple, it is plain, it is clear. Notice uh, on tablets of stone, a herald running with something, you know, you, you, you roll up a bit of paper and you put it, or papyrus, and you put it in the hand of a herald and he has to run and run and run in the hot eastern sun. Uh, and uh, after a while that's gonna get very soggy and uh, gonna be no good to anyone. So the Lord has even taken care of that. He says, write it on tablets of stone so that when he gets to the end and he delivers his message, the message will not be damaged or deteriorated or lost in any shape or form at all. When God speaks, he speaks clearly and plainly. So the biblical response to times when it seems that God is absent or silent, firstly, is to have confidence that he is not silent. And secondly, he is not passive. For what happens in chapter 2 is that God judges Babylon even before Babylon gets to Israel. In chapter 2, and verse, uh, from really verse uh, uh, 6 to verse 20, there are a series of five taunts or woes. The word woe appears five times. It's the kind of thing that armies would do. They would line up to face each other, watching the... Lions yesterday morning, you know, the, the proverbial hacker is done. And the history of the New Zealand hacker, isn't it, is that these, this was something that the, the indigenous people would do at the beginning of a battle, effectively to scare the opposition, to intimidate them. In ancient times, enemies did this. They would make tremendous noise. There would be a great show of force and strength. 
And they would go to battle and they would adopt postures and the whole idea was to gain the psychological advantage. Well, here is God taunting the Babylonians. And they come in the form of these woes. Verse 6, woe to him who piles up stolen goods. He says, you do this all the time and eventually your wealth will come crashing down. In verse 9, woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain. In the end, he speaks about the troubled conscience. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a city on bloodshed. And again, in verse 19, woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to a lifeless stone, wake up. God judges. When he speaks on behalf of his people, he's speaking into the situation. The Babylonians are coming, yes, but there is a restraining hand of God here, isn't there? As he speaks judgment on Israel's judges. And in the midst of it all, God speaks about salvation for his people. In verse 4, He's speaking of the enemies of God. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. In the midst of these statements of judgment and destruction that God is bringing on Babylon, here in the second part of verse 4 is a statement about life. The righteous will live. They will not be destroyed. When God speaks now, he speaks judgment and destruction on his enemies. But in this tiny little glimmer of hope, in the second part of verse 4, he's speaking of life for his people. The righteous will live by his faith. And that, of course, is a tremendous verse, isn't it? It's one that the Apostle Paul will pick up in the New Testament in his letter to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 17. But he almost quotes it. He quotes it. The righteous will live by faith. Remember, that was the great verse that troubled Martin Luther so much. He couldn't stand the idea of the righteousness of God. He thought it was a most dreadful thing. It was all about God's holiness that was never attainable. And it was something that judged him. And he thought the righteousness of God the most dreadful thing in all of the world. And then when he was reading, lecturing actually on Romans in the first chapter in verse 17, he came to see that there is life when we are declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, God is not absent here. He is not passive. He is judging his enemies. He's speaking of salvation for his people. And then wonderfully in verse 14, he gives us a glimpse of his ultimate victory. And notice how he does it. Let's take verse 12 first of all. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed, establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Why? How can you say that, Lord, in the face of the mighty Babylonian empire, in all of its force, its military force? These people who come bent on violence, whose hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. How can you say the nations just simply exhaust themselves? And it's, all, it's all a puff of wind. That's what God is saying here. Why? And the answer is verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He's speaking here of something in the future. Something that one day is coming, which will cause all the glory of the nations to pale into insignificance. There is a greater glory coming, and it is the glory of his kingdom. That in that day, when all the purposes of God are fulfilled, and all the work of God is completed, his glory will be seen in the new heavens and the new earth, and his glory will be without a rival. So to trembling Habakkuk, who in his despair says, Lord, you just simply don't listen. You don't understand. Or if you do, you don't care and you're absent. You don't do anything. And his complaint goes on and on and on. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Why have you got it so wrong, God? 
of which we find an echo in our own hearts so often in the Christian life, when life isn't going our way, it's at times like this we need the biblical response that we see here in chapter 2. God is never silent. And when he speaks to us and we receive his words, when we go after his words, he speaks clearly. And he is never passive. He will judge his enemies. And he will save his people. And he will triumph. We must have faith like this, friends, in the days in which we live. Confidence in the character of God, in his faithfulness, his omnipresence. He is there and he is not silent. So how does God judge the nations? And how will God judge the nations? And how will God save his people? And of course the answer is through the gospel. For the gospel that is life to his people will be death to those who reject it. And we would do well in our day of growing secularism and advances upon Christian liberties to remind ourselves that our response is to be one of compassion and awareness. For just as was the case with the Babylonians, God's judgment will come even upon a secular nation like ours in the 21st century. And God's judgments are severe. He is not mocked. He sees. He understands, as Habakkuk says in chapter 1, verse 13, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. And he cannot and he will not. And so as it was with Jesus Christ, as he advanced towards Jerusalem to go to arrest and trial and crucifixion, and by that to atone for our sins, as he approaches Jerusalem, coming down off the Mount of Olives, he weeps over Jerusalem, over Jerusalem's rejection and Jerusalem's rebellion, rejection of him and rebellion towards him. I think in many ways that should typify our response today to our secular culture with all of its confusion, not knowing its moral left from its right hand in all of its chaos, in all of its brokenness, there is judgment in the gospel for those who reject Christ. But there is salvation for those whose faith is in Christ. And that little glimpse in verse 4, the righteous will live by his faith, is the news that whatever the trouble is and whatever is coming our way, our salvation is secure. That was the hope for Habakkuk in his day. And it's a hope that's picked up through the rest of this book and particularly in the wonderful news in the third chapter where it comes to the end and God speaking through Habakkuk in verses 17 and 18 has to say, yes, there's trouble coming. Yes, judgment is coming. You, you can't play around with God. And he says, though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vines, the olive crop fails, the fruit fields produce no food, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. There is something greater, isn't there, than all the trials of this life. There is something greater than all the tests and the difficulties and that is the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ and this is safe and this is secure and this is part of that glory that is glimpsed of here in chapter 2 of that day that is coming when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as water covers the sea so Habakkuk is a help for living in tough times and times when it seems that God is silent and God is absent. Maybe that's your experience tonight, not just as part of this culture, but in your own life. 
Well, I trust you see that there's a lot to be encouraged about here. That when our hearts are turned back to God in faith, he speaks through his word. He saves through the gospel. And we have every reason to be comforted and confident in his character. He is the Lord who is in his holy temple before whom the whole earth is silent before him. And there is coming a day when the whole cosmos will be filled with the knowledge of his glory. Well, may these things support us and encourage us in lean times that our vision may be great of God's character and faithfulness and our hope may be in his faithfulness and his glory. We're going to sing to close this evening the hymn, Long as I live, I'll bless your name, my King, my God of love. We'll stand to worship God together. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.